You're listening to the UNX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the NX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red tic tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Let's get into some news from this last week. The U.S. tactical fighter jets were sent to intercept a suspicious object near Hawaii. The incident, which took place on February 14th, saw the F-22s intercept what was believed to be some sort of balloon. However, specific details remain unknown. (laughs) What? F-22s are not usually scrambled to intercept something as mundane as a balloon. So was it really a balloon? Well, let's continue. The adjacent general of Hawaii, Kenneth S. Hara, stated that Indus Pacific Command detected a high-altitude object floating in the air in the vicinity of the Hawaiian Islands. In accordance with Homeland Defense procedures, Pacific Air Forces launched tactical aircraft to intercept and identify the object, visually confirming an unmanned balloon without observable identification markings. The mystery was compounded by reports of powerful explosion sounds by locals in the area, with an Air Force spokesperson later insisting that the responding aircraft did not destroy the balloon. Sightings of the object posted on social media indicated a white oblong object with two con trails. The pilot that witnessed this object stated that the UFO remained in one spot for at least 40 minutes. So exactly what the object was remains something of a mystery. Well, I can tell you it's probably not a balloon if it can stay in one spot for at least 40 minutes. It has been speculated that it could be some sort of intelligence gathering balloon. However, it still remains unclear who might have launched it or why it had been intercepted. With the news out of the way, my guest does not need an introduction as he's already been on my show 
But Luis Elizondo was the program director of ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which was created in 2007 until its date of termination in 2012. Since then, he's been part of To The Stars Academy in 2017 and his own TV show called Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation and to talk about this topic to the everyday people pushing for UAP transparency. Hey there, Lou. Welcome once again to Shifting the Paradigm. How is everything going for you at the moment? Christina, everything is going quite well. Thank you very much. It's always a little bit of a, uh, a slow motion train wreck, right? <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of things happening all at once um, and it's trying to to um, to keep organized the, the chaos. Uh, but it's it's all in a good it's all in a good way. Um, my my colleagues and I are extremely busy uh, working with our friends on the Hill, working with our friends in government, uh, working with wonderful folks like you and your 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 wonderful audience. So. Um, I, I couldn't I couldn't ask for uh, for anything else. Um, all is all is quite well. Thank you. Well, Lou, I want to thank you for not only coming on my show today, but also thank you for all the shows you go on, making yourself available both to the big time mainstream media outlets and podcast shows globally. I am witness to the fact that your dedication to find out these answers we are all seeking is bringing so many enthusiasts and researchers into this topic from a wide age range. So before we start, there is one thing that I would like you to clarify. Various critics have defined you as a career disinformation agent, when in reality, you are part of counterintelligence. This can make it confusing to newbies and young people just getting into this topic when they read such comments or listen to some of these people. For those that may not know, can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, sure. There's a fundamental difference. Counterintelligence is like playing a game of chess. Uh, it's it's knowing what your enemy knows about you. Um, that's counterintelligence, quite quite bluntly. So, if you were to have a chess board, in essence, um, human intelligence or foreign intelligence (FI) is knowing what your opponent's chess pieces can do. Counterintelligence is that, but also knowing what your opponent knows about your pieces and what they can do. Um, disinformation is something different. That's psychological operations. Um, that is in, in a completely different realm. Usually what we call referred to as psyops, um, and disinformation is not typically a counterintelligence function. Um, there are, are elements occasionally where counterintelligence efforts may involve a de what we call denial and deception. Uh, but that is uh, certainly not the case when it comes to um, to this topic. I think there's a lot of mystery of what counterintelligence is. Um, you know, but bottom line is, is, I guess in the vernacular, it, the easiest way to explain it is again playing a game of chess uh, against someone. And counterintelligence is not know not only knowing what their pieces can do, but what they know what your pieces can do, and then being able to to counter that or or to neutralize that. As far as my my critics look, I, I don't mind critics. Um, I, I think uh, I think everybody's entitled to opinion. What I don't like are people that claim disinformation who are themselves <laughs> providing disinformation, which is precisely precisely what we're seeing here. Uh, we're seeing a uh, really, in essence, an, an organized gang uh, of criminals, people that have been convicted for uh, um, for stealing. And when I say stealing, I don't mean stealing like robbing a bank and, you know, at least having the guts to go do it. I'm, I'm talking about picking your pockets and stealing your identity. People that have five uh, felony accounts and, and in some cases up to 12 charges. Uh, in other cases, individuals who have, have been uh, found guilty of of assaulting and, and battery of, uh, of a female, of a woman. Um, you know, we're talking about really the, the I hate to say it, but, but the, lo the low lives of society, um, people who, who have spent an entire career and lifetime of taking advantage of other individuals and frankly, lying to them. And of course, um, I'm not surprised that these individuals come out and they start lying about me or other people. Um, because that's what criminals do, you know, and and by the way, that truth is is not only going to come out, but it's also publicly available so anybody can see it. Um, I, I think what concerns me is when when 
the average person doesn't realize that they're being led astray by some of these individuals who don't have any scruples. And, um, and that's the real tragedy because a lot of these individuals are interested and they're hungry for the truth and they want to know what's going on. And they're being misled purposely by, by a faction of, of, of individuals uh, who, who are engaged in, in, you know, lar large scale fraud and deception, and they've been found guilty of it in the past. So this is problematic um, because what happens is when those individuals find out that they've been they've been quote unquote had and taken advantage of, they get uh, disenfranchised, and they may leave this entire topic of of the topic of UFOs altogether because they they feel betrayed or they feel that you know their their trust has been been in some way violated and it has. Um, I guess my message to them is look you know please keep the faith we're, we're not all that way um, we're not all uh hucksters and fraudsters we're not trying to take advantage of you we're not we don't want anything from you um all we want is your opinion uh we're not asking you for a dime of your money we're not asking for a penny of anything um we're asking you just to use your brain and, and to engage and so that's really what what um what we're doing right now and as far as the the, the critics out there again i don't mind the healthy criticism what i don't like are liars and that's what, unfortunately, in some cases we're dealing with, you know, it, it, to some degree, I feel like a bit of a new sheriff in town, right? Comes in to try to clean up the streets. And uh, the first thing that the sheriff finds out is that a bunch of, of hucksters and fraudsters come out of the shadows, right? Um, trying to to throw stones and uh, because they don't want the streets clean. They 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 want to keep things as they were, status quo, confusion, and and these, if you will, these 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 small micro cottage industries where they're taking advantage of people, you know, give me $29.95 and I'll sell you a video or give me $29.95 and I'll, I'll sell you this or that or a t-shirt or I'll give you an encounter with a UFO or some, you know, happy horse poo like that. When in reality, we're talking about perhaps one of the greatest enigmas facing our species. We're talking about something that's truly existential potentially. And anybody who is going to try to, to hijack that, I think is, you know, in, from my perspective, I think it's problematic. And so there's my frustration, Christina. Lou, I've watched some of the conversations on different forums and chat communities across the internet. And something I keep seeing are a small percentage of people who accuse you of pushing a threat narrative, accusing you of twisting the topic to an evil aliens on the verge of invading Earth, rather than a more peaceful reason for a non-human presence being here. And the justification is usually written that if they wanted to do that, they would have entered into conflict conflict with us a long time ago. What would you like to say to address this point and the individuals accusing you of that? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a national security guy. My job was always paid to be paranoid and, and you know, uh, trust but verify. Um, I'm not asking you necessarily to, to accept the threat narrative because, you know, I'm not sure there's a threat narrative there. What I'm simply asking people to do is remain fair and objective. Look, here's the bottom line. Um, anybody out there who says, oh, well, they're here for peaceful purposes and they're here to stop us from annihilating ourselves from nuclear technology. The bottom line is you're completely ill-informed. That's the bottom line. You, you, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And I don't mean any offense by it, but let's let's look at real facts and scenarios here. In 1945, the U.S. government, us, vaporized over 500,000 individuals instantly during the dropping of the, the atomic bombs of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, we, we literally transitioned human beings from a, from a solid state to a gaseous state. Um, nowhere were, were UAPs there to stop that from happening and annihilating each other. In fact, nowhere were there UAPs stopping World War I or World War II or the Korean War or Vietnam. In fact, nowhere were there UAPs stopping COVID or, or global climate change or um, world hunger, right? In fact, there's very little evidence to suggest at all that whatever is out there is out there for benevolent reasons. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's out there for malevolent reasons, but to say that, oh, they're here to help us from block, that's pure conjecture. That's horseshit. Yeah, that's just that's just someone spewing off their opinion without any any facts or data at all to suggest that. What we do know is that there seems to be a keen interest in our our nuclear and military capabilities, and not just us, but around the world. That that does seem to be pretty clear. So um, you know, you can fill in the blanks what it means. Now, does it mean that they're here for hostile intent? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that they're here for a threat? No, it doesn't. But what it simply means is that there's no evidence to suggest that they're here for anything humanitarian. So, you know, does that mean that they're here for hostile reasons? Not necessarily. Does it mean that they're here like we are when we go out to, let's say, the, the African plains and the Serengeti and, and, and monitor the wildebeest migration? Maybe they're just here to observe. We, we don't know. We simply don't know enough yet about 
about this enigma to to have a, a cogent conversation about it. We're just now at the point where we've recognized that they're real as a U.S. government. So anybody out there who wants to insert their narrative or preconceived notion of what this is, I think it's premature. And I frankly, I think it's irresponsible. And especially people who go out there and start peddling, you know, things to 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 suggest that when there's absolutely zero empirical data uh, that that supports that that finding. Um, so let's be real. Let's have a real conversation here. You know, um, that that that's my perspective, anyways. Again, I'm not trying to to, to fear monger or, or scare anybody, but I am here to provide real data. You know, and I'm sorry that data doesn't comport to your preconceived narrative or or what your opinion is or what you're trying to sell people. You're right. We simply don't know. We can only observe their behaviors. With the recent article by Christopher Mellon, there was so much eye-opening content posing so many important questions. You work closely with Mr. Mellon. And can, can you update us on what kind of fallout or positive effects have come around as a result of that article? Sure, but it's not just that article. Let, let me preface by saying Chris Mellon is, is, is absolutely one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever had the honor and privilege to work with. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, I've always said before, there's five people that I can count who have called me uh, in the middle of the night at four in the morning and said, put your boots on, you need to go to war, I would do it. Okay, Chris Mellon is one of those folks. People know that General Mattis is another one, one of those individuals. There's a few others uh, of those other individuals that will probably at some point come out to light. Um, Chris is an incredible intellectual. He's also an incredible strategist, uh, and he's he's a remarkable patriot. Um, he he has served his his country um, since day one, both in the legislative and the executive branches. Uh, he he truly is a lead, a living legend in 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 every aspect of the, of of the term. Uh, and so what he embodies is something that I admire very much, and that's that's truth above all. Um, the article that he recently wrote uh, about the Air Force, or the, if you will, the lack of Air Force involvement in this topic, I think is a long time coming. Um, that's a result of years and years of frustration trying to get individuals in the Air Force engaged. And I think it's important to note that when Chris wrote that letter, he wasn't saying the whole Air Force is is negligent or bad. He's simply saying that the bureaucracy isn't responsive like it is with may, perhaps the Navy and other other services who have stepped forward to have this conversation. Um, you know, look, recently, Secretary of the Air Force, Kendall, and, and no offense to him, you know, look, I, I, I serve my country honorably as well. Uh, and he was picked by, by the administration to serve as secretary. But when the Secretary of Air Force comes out and acknowledges, yes, we are aware of UAPs, we know the reality of these things, but because we don't know where they're from, we don't consider them a threat. That's the same thing as saying a, 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 a submarine pops out of the Potomac River uh, right there in front of the Pentagon and the White House, but because it's not flying a U.S. flag or, or a Russian flag, we're just going to ignore it because we don't know if it's a threat or not, so therefore it's not a priority. That that that, that doesn't make sense. That's not logical thinking. That's not what, what, what we need to hear. And frankly, to some degree, it's probably why we're in the predicament we are with, with Russia and Ukraine right now, because... Um, you know, we, we, we have rested on our laurels so long that we've become um, almost to some degree apathetic. We, 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 we think that, that U.S. preeminence, or in this case, as it relates to the UAP topic, that we know everything. Well, guess what? We don't. And uh, the, the sooner we can, we can reconcile that reality, the sooner maybe we can do something about it. And in the article, Chris brings up the North American Aerospace Defense Command. In 2008, NORAD moved its day-to-day -day operations to the U.S. Northern Command Headquarters building at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, while redesignating the Cheyenne Mountain installation as a backup command center. Now, the chief priority of NORAD is assessing aerospace threats, both for Canada and the United States through their N2C2 command domain. Maine. In your time with ATIP, would it be safe to assume you had a working relationship with the Air Domain Chief at NORAD resulting in the receipts of reports of UAP incursions over the North American continental airspace? Well, it, indirectly. So we had an individual who was a member of STRATCOM, Strategic Command. And if you look at what, what STRATCOM's mission is, it is to basically act as a connective tissue 
with all the other commands. Um, and so vis-a-vis -vis that individual, um, I, I can't say who he is now, but at some point I suspect he'll probably come out in public. Um, that, that individual who was assigned to Stratcom had the authority to reach out to all these other organizations. And it's not just NORAD, for example. Um, there, were, there were other organizations and commands that this individual was responsible for interlocking with on a, a regular routine basis. Okay, so based on your experience dealing with them, did you find yourself at any time coming to the opinion that you were only receiving a restricted handful of misidentifications with the occasional truly anomalous case, or that you were actually getting the full unthrottled flow of cases completely unrestricted? Uh, that's a fantastic question. You know, we, we always wound up scratching our head and wondered, are we getting a, uh, a a filtered version of the information? Are we getting what they call raw and unevaluated information or intelligence? Um, in some cases, we were getting the raw information. In other cases, we were getting a bit of the excuse of vernacular, but but the Heisman, right? Where someone is kind of kind of doing this and, and giving you a, a, a face palm, um, which of course is frustrating. Um, there were some organizations that were far more forthcoming than others. Some of the commands uh, were, were very cooperative uh, in some of the organizations uh, in the intelligence community. While others were, were a bit reticent, um, I think they were still suffering from, from some of the stigma associated with this topic historically uh, that their organizations and agencies were involved with. Uh, in other cases, uh, we did. We had what we call non-responsive um, responses where they'd say, look, you know, um, we don't have anything. And this goes to the point, you know, if you were to do a Freedom of Information Act and ask the U.S. government or the intelligence community how many UFO reports you have, they'll probably say, man, not many. But if you ask how many unreconciled uh, uh, UAS reports, right, or uh, um, anomalous uh, aircraft uh, that haven't been identified, then you might get something else in return because the term UFO or UAP tends to be a bit of a dirty word still to some degree. Uh, because of the connotations and and, and what it means. Um, so you'll see like in a lot of the, the, the deck logs by some of the ships, they'll call them drones. Um, that's because they know these deck logs are unclassified and frankly, they can be FOIA'd, Freedom of Information Act. And uh, in so doing, um, you know, the government doesn't want to be caught saying, well, we don't have any information. And all of a sudden now here's a deck log talking about three or four UFOs that they've encountered. So a lot of times I'll use the term drone. And, and some of that is for what we call OPSEC reasons, operational security reasons. And you know what? I'll be the first one to say that we've been guilty of that as well. Um, you know, when I, when I first requested the release of the videos that now everybody talks about um, on the 1910, which is the form that you have to use to release them, in that justification, I referred to these three videos as UASs, um, unidentified aerial systems, because that's exactly what they were. Um, I could not say UFO or UAP because in so doing in an unclassified document, I would have inevitably tipped our hand um, to the fact that we were looking at UFOs, something that was very, very tightly controlled. It was not public knowledge. And there was a very, very small list of individuals who were allowed to know that information. So um, to the same degree, you know, that that other services and agencies have done that, I'll be the first one to tell you we did it too. Uh, we did it deliberately so we wouldn't have necessarily tipped our hand to the fact we were looking at UFOs to a group of people that were not read on or cleared to know that. Did you find that the majority of the reports ended up being identified? Uh, well, you know, that, that, that's, that's a good question. That, that talks about metrics, you know. Um, our hope was that we could identify 100% of them. And reality is we, we, we could not. <clears throat> In fact, we set up a, a, a filter, if you will, think of a coffee filter to, to filter the grains of the coffee. We felt a, a designed the filters specifically to try to catch everything that we knew would be either considered a blue force technology or our technology and a red force technology or an enemy technology. And what you had left over that didn't get caught by the filter is that delta, if you will, uh, the difference um, between the two. And so when you have things, that's, that's where the five observables come into play. When you have things that are maneuvering at, you know, not, you know, 15 or 16 Gs, but, but 300, 400, 600, 700 G forces, and by the way, are able to travel at hypersonic velocities, and oh, by the way, display some sort of camouflage or cloaking, and oh, by the way, display some sort of 
transmedium capability, the operate the ability to operate in air and water and possibly in space without a compromise of their performance characteristics. And oh, by the way, also some sort of anti-gravity, right, in the vernacular, the, the ability to defy Earth's natural gravity without associated technologies like wings or, or thrust or intakes or engines or propulsion, um, then you have something truly extraordinary. And those were the cases that ATIP really focused on, were those that, that couldn't be readily explained as a drone or a missile or a balloon or a quadcopter or an aircraft or a helicopter or, you know, fill in the blanks. Lou, we're coming up against a break. We'll be right back. Alternative talk you can trust. The X. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi, I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should, too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation And all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina. Become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research, and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray history shows us what gold does when people aren't sure aren't sure about the government the stock market their jobs or their retirement savings our national debt is skyrocketing gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover so what can you do right now to protect yourself call united gold group we offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You're listening to the UnX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. What is that? A deer? I can't tell. Is that a bear? Wait, is that a person? At night. 
your vision drastically changes. Imagine thermal imaging and the ability to see clearly up to 1,000 yards at night. That ability is a reality with AGM Global Vision, offering high-quality thermal and night vision optics. Get crisp and clear images that are Wi-Fi compatible, recordable, and storable. AGM Global Vision has an extensive range of quality-made rifle scopes, clip-on systems, spotting scopes, binoculars, goggles, lasers, and infrared illumination. Get the edge at night with crystal clear sight. Call 928. 333-4300 or visit agmglobalvision.com Use promo code TSL and get 10% off. That's agmglobalvision.com This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is Lou Elizondo, and we were just talking about Chris Mellon's recent article. Well, the article by by Mr. Mellon really set me off looking into the scope of NORAD and its reach in early warnings and aerospace defense. And by looking into publicly available information, I found that NORAD is indeed operating on a larger scope than I previously imagined, being operationally present at facilities such as Joint Base Ellendorf Richardson in Alaska, Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, and even overseas, for example, example, at Tolley Air Force Base in Greenland. Part of the potential threat response to airspace incursions is a Project Noble Eagle, which has been in place since 9-11. And this involves a report coming in from a specific region to N2C2 command domain, which results in a rapid response with the scrambling of jet interceptions to interpret and identify aircraft that either don't show a transponder signal or enter restricted airspace, among other things, being perceived as a potential threat. Now, it makes sense to me that there must have been occasions where jets have been scrambled to interpret aircraft demonstrating anomalous flight characteristics, such as what we see with UAP. Are you aware of this being the case with any reports you've seen? Yeah, Christina, it happens a lot more than you might think. Um, I uh, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with a, a former watch officer of, at NORAD, a uh, a colonel, which, as most people know, is, is is fairly senior in rank. I mean, this is not a not a spring chicken. Uh, this is somebody who's being groomed probably for for general officer and and, and some significant command positions. And so, um, the watch officer's job is just that: is it's it's to watch the skies, watch what's going on have a uh, persistent situation awareness of the uh, uh, airspace. And uh, one of the incidents that he was recalling to us was that uh, they picked up a UAP uh, up over Canada. And as you said before, Canada and the U.S. share a, a airspace together, especially over North America. And so we, we cooperate together. In fact, the, the deputy commander of NORAD is a Canadian. A lot of people don't know that. And so we work together to, to protect our, our skies together. And there was a UAP coming in uh, out of uh, out of um, out of Canada, very very fast, very very high, uh, to the point where uh, the commander on the ground there at NORAD said, "I want you to launch everything we we have against this thing and catch it. I want to know what this thing is." And as this thing pursued, uh, continued, and was pursued by our aircraft, it continued over the eastern seaboard and wound up leaving uh, U.S. airspace somewhere over uh, over Florida towards Cuba. And uh, we weren't ever able to catch it. Now think about what that means, right? The, the best and the, and the strongest country in the world with some of the most sophisticated aircraft, um, despite the commander saying, throw everything we have at it and try to catch this thing, we weren't able to do it. Um, and so that's just one example of many where where Nord has been engaged in these things. But let's 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 preface this, NORAD isn't necessarily going to call them UAP, okay, or UFOs. Um, chances are they're going to call them something else, uh, probably something to the tune of uh, uh, unresolved um, type anomaly. And uh, therein lies part of the problem, because when you do a Freedom of Information Act and you say, what do you have on UFOs? NORAD says, we don't. 
<laughs> because we don't track UFOs. Uh, what we track are, are something else. We call them something else. And so um, there, therein lies some of the challenge when people are trying to say, well, you know, I, 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 I submitted a Freedom of Information Act to NORAD and it came back with nothing. Well, because you're asking for the wrong thing, unfortunately. Was there a significant number of those Noble Eagle cases that ended up classified as unknowns? Um, you know, I'm not going to comment on th something that might or might not be classified. I have to be very careful with that. Um, as you know, Christina and, and some of your listeners, I still hold a, a security clearance. Um, I still have am obligated to protect classified information, and I intend to do so. So I, I don't want to say anything that could compromise in any way some sort of national security capability. Um, so as far as what might be classified and what might be unclassified, um, uh, unless I'm sure something is unclassified, I, I just I just simply can't talk about it. And I totally understand that. So when there is an active threat assessment situation occurring, there is a part of the operation called ONEC, which stands for Operation Noble Eagle Conference, which where where various intelligence and security agencies are long pulled into the data stream. Are you of the opinion that any of those reports pertaining to UAP specifically will be declassified? And if not, will they at least get in front of the eyes of members of Congress? Yeah, I'm very confident that Congress, you know, Congress is persistent and uh, Congress has now now uh, been made aware of the fact that that these things are real and that the U.S. government knows that they're real. So so they are definitely on the case. Um, will they be brought into the loop on everything that the executive branch knows? Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, but enough people now are talking to Congress where the executive branch now, uh, there's an expectation to, to deliver some information. And this is why you see with the recent Gillibrand Amendment, uh, that was a bipartisan effort with, with folks like Marco Rubio, et cetera. Um, this is truly historic because they're not going to allow obfuscation anymore. They're not going to allow people to say, well, you know, we really don't know. Well, you know what? We're paying you to know. So if you don't know, we'll fire you and we'll find somebody else who can find out. But to say that you don't know anymore and it's not a priority, um, that that doesn't fly. That 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 excuse is, is no mas. Um, we, we now have an obligation to to reconcile and try to figure out what these things are, whatever they may be. Um, we we now have to have a, have that conversation, and so Congress, I don't think, is going to going to let this go. Um, I do think that there are some efforts right now behind the scenes with the executive branch to finally do the right thing. Um, my old office, in particular, USDI. I'm not going to say which specific office is within, um, but there does seem to be some leadership engagement saying, "Okay, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe we should." Maybe we should look at this a little bit differently. Maybe we need to write the, hire the right expertise and the, and the right people to, to actually look at this and not just whitewash it and try to bury it. Um, you know, I, I remain hopeful, but make no mistake, if, if, if it turns out that this is going to be a tip 2.0 and they're going to try to obfuscate and bury this thing, then, then we will continue to be very, very vocal and, and call these people out by name. I have no problem doing that at all. Speaking about Congress, you recently went to Washington, D.C. again to have some high-level meetings. Can you tell us some of the objectives you had when you were there? And do you believe those objectives were met positively? Yeah, simple. Um, our, our mission is awareness and accountability. That's simple. Two things. Make people aware uh, in, in, in key leadership roles and hold the government accountable. Um, because ultimately that's what the government should be, it should be accountable to the American people and to Congress. Um, so that was our mission. Um, were we effective? Um, I believe so. Um, I think we have a, a coalition of individuals now uh, who are well past the question of whether or not it's real. They know it's real. They've seen the classified data. They've seen the information. They've met the individuals who, who are running certain efforts. And frankly, we can't explain what we're seeing, period. Um, and if you think that we're talking about old cases like the Nimitz back in 2004 or the USS Roosevelt uh, in 2015 and, and whatnot, um, you're mistaken. We're talking about things that occur as, as recently as last week. Um, there is a, a, a regular continuing flow of information regarding UAP that continues to, to be reported, fortunately. Now, there's still some information that isn't getting reported, uh, and that's a problem because the law says you have to report it. So at this point, if, if, if it's not being reported, whoever's responsible for that, you're not breaking the law. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's an issue. 
because it's pretty clear what the law says. So either 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 you report it or you're your your violation of the law. Um, and so that's where the accountability piece comes in, right? Um, if, if you offer a carrot and a stick, hopefully people do the right thing. But in the case that some people don't want to, well, now it's time to you know break out the stick and say, okay, look, now you're in a violation of law. That's a criminal issue, and you can either be fired or frank, frankly put to jail. You know, if, if if you don't do do the right thing. So um, that's that's why that law is so historic. That's why engagement with our our elected officials is so important important. So they're armed with with real information and valid information involving this topic. It's not just innuendos and you know. Uh, analogies it's it's hard data it's stuff that's taken from you know electro optical data things that we spend millions if not more uh amount of money on trying to 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 keep a competitive edge over our adversaries well that same technology can be used to to track uap and a bit of a, a long shot question here lou but do you still retain security clearance that enables you to keep up to date on what is happening within classified uap research programs today and if so do you believe they are helping you meet your objectives in your visits to dc well i've, I've made no no bones about it um I, I do have an active top secret security clearance um and and some other stuff i won't go into here um, what does that mean? Well, it means that I can't discuss, it means two things, actually. I don't think people are really aware of it. They're, they're aware of one side of that requirement, which is I can never discuss classified information because of my non-disclosure agreement. But it also means I can't lie um, because we are subject to regular routine polygraph examinations and psychological evaluations and all sorts of other stuff. And so if, if it is found that, let's say, me having this conversation with you or I lie to you or the American people, um, that would would hurt my security clearance because that would go back and say, okay, so Lou's lying. And if Lou's lying, then then we've got a bigger issue on our hands because now we're not sure he can hold a, a top secret security clearance and what else is he lying about? So it, it it's not easy. People think, oh, well, you know, security clearance, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot. Uh, it's very invasive. And if anybody has, has never had a security clearance, a TS security clearance, and you want one, um, just try getting a TSSCI. It, it's not fun. Um, it's very, very invasive, and and they go into every bit of your background. And by the way, you're part of something called CE, which is a continuous evaluation, meaning at any time they're looking at your credit score, they're looking at anything that you may have done that could somehow call into question your character, right? And so, whereas having an, a, a top secret security clearance prevents you from 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 discussing classified information, it also prevents you from lying. And that's important. And people seem to forget that. And this is why the whole disinformation nonsense that you hear people coming out with, um, it's, it's absolute, you know, horse manure. Um, I'll say it politely, uh, because these are people who have no idea. Most of these people couldn't even qualify for security clearance themselves. Um, so, you know, they, they, they have absolutely no qualifications to, to discuss um, whether something is a, is a disinformation operation or not. But then there's also laws and there's security issues. So you look at things like Executive Order 12333, United States Intelligence Activities. You look at what it takes from a security apparatus, EO12958, and you look at things like DOD Directive 5240.1 and DOD Directive. Uh, yeah, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. I don't want to waste your, your time here, but there's a lot of rules and requirements for not only intelligence operations and activities, but also maintaining a security clearance and what it takes to hold a security clearance. Um, and, and until you know that, then it's, you know, it, it, people are kind of kind of misinformed about that. They, they like to fill in, you know, with innuendo as well, he must be a disinformation agent because he has a security clearance. No, actually, I, I'm held to a higher standard. It means I can't lie. You know, all this crap you see behind me and I could show you a whole bunch more. Um is is a result of my dedication and my promise to the American people and my country that I would I would never tell a secret and I'd always tell the truth. And so um, anybody who's had a security clearance will tell you the same thing. Wow. Based on those clearances, without giving away classified information, have you become aware of any conceivable security reason why the UAP topic having a non-human origin could be withheld by the U.S. government or other governments across the globe? And if so, in your opinion, is it a legit reason or an outdated reason related to not causing panic? Christina, great question. Um, and I, I don't mean that lightly. Um, there was a time where, you know, and I still feel this way that it, it, it's, 
inconscionable and and uh, there's no excuse to hold what we call extra governmental activities, extra constitutional activities. We're all held to the constitution the same and either it means something or it doesn't. Um, and we've all agreed that it means something. So therefore we are all, all held to the constitution. Are there reasons why in the past, maybe certain people weren't briefed to this topic or maybe the American people weren't made aware? Yeah, there are reasons. Um, do I agree with those reasons? No, but do I understand why people may have made those choices in the past? Yeah, I do. I actually do. And it makes sense. Um, again, I don't agree with it. Um, to me, I think the truth is always more important. You know, even if I have cancer, I want my doctor to tell me, look, Lou, you got cancer. You know, don't lie to me because it's bad news. I, I need to know. Um, and I think the same holds true for this topic. Um, you know, there was a lot of things going on in this country at the height of the Cold War, and we had very real threats um, with, with other countries. And it was a winner takes all chessboard. Um, so there was a very real threat out there. And then you had this other topic here of UAPs where we weren't surely, we weren't, we weren't really sure what they were or where they're from or what they want or their capabilities. And so, you know, that was kind of put on the back burner for a little bit while we could focus on this other, other immediate threat, which is a country that has, you know, real nuclear weapons and pointed at us. Um, and, uh, despite what people may think about the cold war, the cold war was actually pretty hot. Um, it was a kind of a, a winner takes all environment where we were doing these proxy wars all over the world, um, uh, against the then Soviet union and they were doing against us. Um, so there was a very real threat. And so I can understand why, and, and I plan to address some of that in, in my book, um, what I've, what I've come to learn. On, on why some people may have want to kept quiet about it. And again, I'll, I just want to say for the record, I don't agree with that position, but but I can understand it. It, it, it. it does make sense. And I think when people find out, they're going to say, well, you know what, Lou, you're right. It does. Again, I don't agree with it, but but I can see how some people may have may have thought that way. When you frame it like that, it can make sense. Now, I would like to switch the topic to the June report mentioning radio frequencies being detected during UAP encounters. In your opinion, do you think a follow-up course of action of the introduction of specific radar systems used to track them by tuning into a specific frequency or a range of frequencies has been implemented or should be implemented as part of solving this mystery um yeah so so radio frequency was kind of in the vernacular uh, what we're talking about are frequencies that that can be detected on the electromagnetic spectrum okay and the electromagnetic spectrum is huge you know we visible light is just a very 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 narrow spectrum uh if you will band within within that greater spectrum of of electromagnetics and so we call it electro optical uh, visible light. And of course, right below that you have infrared, and right above that you have ultraviolet, and then it goes all the way up to X-ray, and ultimately, you know, gamma radiation, cosmic cosmic radiation. Um, you know, the, the, really, the, what what that's about is about signature detection. Are there identifiable signatures that can be picked up within the electromagnetic spectrum as they relate to UAP? Um, so that's that's where that language really comes from. You know, are there is there data that we can use to 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 detect these, these things maybe beyond the visual spectrum? Um, I'm not going to comment whether or not we have made any headway one way or the other uh, regarding that. Um, clearly, it's in the law. So uh, what that means is we have to continue focusing on it. Whether or not we've made any headway is something that I, I wouldn't be able to discuss at this time. It has been suggested by some that certain radio frequencies and in the electro optical, electromagnetic spectrums, etc., may also be used to determine where a UAP could appear, supposedly well in advance. Is this something you've heard or come across yourself? Well, again, this goes back to signature collection data, right? So in, in intelligence, we have things called human intelligence, which is where you're talking to human sources. But then you have signals intelligence and you have imagery intelligence and you have electronic emissions intelligence, ELINT, and you have all sorts of measurements intelligence, MASINT, right? Uh, you have all sorts of different types of ways to collect information to help you assess uh, and determine and hopefully at some point predict what your uh, adversary is going to do. 
Um, and you know, this is not even uncommon even in the business world. Uh, we have business intelligence to help us predict what our competition is going to do in the next six months with certain products or perhaps a, a merger and an acquisition. So to 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 ask the question whether or not the U.S. government will be looking at at these type of ways to help ultimately predict UAP activity, I don't think is is. Uh, out of the realm of reality. In fact, everybody now knows we we tried to do that in ATIP, and and I'm not going to go into detail here right now. But but there were some things that we did that we 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 did for the specific reason of trying to lure these things out. Um, and it turns out that you know these things could be could be pretty successful if you know what you're doing. That seems very interesting. I've been asked by a few people since our last interview, and it was brought up on my show with Jimmy Church just a few days ago, to ask you if you've ever been to Antarctica. Forgive me, my uh, ear, that was not that was not planned. <laughs> um, no, I have not been to Antarctica. Um, I would love to go, um, but no, I have not been to Antarctica. As most people know, that's a pretty pretty expensive endeavor it takes a lot of logistics and resources even if you go by the government you know there's a lot of planning and preparations and authorities that you need to get down there because it is so remote um you know obviously the arctic regions both north pole and south pole uh arctic and antarctic regions are interesting because there's not a whole lot of persistent surveillance up there um you know, most people, when you look at the Earth, you see you see satellites going around it. You have a few that are on a polar orbit, what we call polar orbits. Um, but uh, the vast majority are are you know looking at civilization. They're looking at things you know from a certain latitude down to a certain latitude. Um, there's not a whole lot going on at the poles, and some people have have speculated maybe that is potentially a, a, an undiscovered hotspot. Maybe these things are coming in and out of out of the polar regions. Certainly, certainly worth looking at, in my opinion. Well, on that note, do you believe that there is something going on with UAP in Antarctica, or at least some game changing evidence located there that is controversial and being kept tightly under wraps? Yeah, people have speculated for a long time that that there's stuff going on in, in Antarctica. Um, and, you know, of course, in, in the vacuum of information and the lack of information, um, that leads the way for speculation. Um, you know, Antarctica is a unique place. I mean, it is an entire continent. It's not just a bunch of ice floating in the water. Um, there's landmass under there, miles beneath, beneath the ice. Uh, there are lakes there. There's biomes there. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, in Antarctica. Um, some people have speculated that these UFOs are in fact also part of a greater phenomenon called USOs, unidentified submersible objects, and that these things uh, may in fact um, spend quite a bit of their time in the water and in the oceans. And, you know, Antarctic Ocean is, uh, and the Arctic Ocean are, are there's a lot of water there. Uh, you know, there's, unlike the North Pole, which is basically a floating ice cap, we, 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 you know, we and our allies and some of our adversaries actually can, you can take a submarine and go from one point to the other uh, underneath the, the polar ice cap. Um, you can't do that in Antarctica because there's land there. And so um, some people, especially some old reports coming from some old expeditions have reported some pretty extraordinary findings there. The question is, you know, can, can those findings be substantiated? In ATIP, we didn't focus so much on Antarctica simply because most of our efforts were focused on U.S. military equities and assets, meaning people, uh, equipment, property, um, and, and most U.S. military assets are not in the Arctic. They're actually, you know, in combat areas and, and here in the United States and whatnot. So, so that's where most of our focus was during ATIP. Um, do I think it's worth exploring? Absolutely. I think we need to cast a very, very wide net and, and see what fish we can catch with that net. So interesting and so mysterious. It's fascinating for sure. Lou, we're coming up against a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes non-fiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. 
Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi folks, these uncertain times can cause uncertain gut slowdown. Worry and fear can wreak havoc on our digestion, making it hard to feel optimum. Bloating, less energy, and occasional constipation can slow you down in your daily activity. Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea can help get things moving so you can get that boost of energy you need. Life Change Tea helps protect and defend your health from intruders. It's a weird time right now with all the uncertainty, so gear up and defend your health. Where do you go to purchase? Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. The specials are on the front page and we have numerous supplements to help combat intruders. It's time to take charge of our health and to feel better in life. It's time to live. Again, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network, and you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. You ever notice your home doesn't smell as fresh as it used to? It's not you. As homes age, paint and carpet, they absorb all different kinds of odors, seemingly impossible to get rid of over time. But the Eden Pure Thunderstorm Air Purifier is guaranteed to eliminate those odors. The thunderstorm sends out the OH3 molecules into the air. It seeks out those nasty smells, germs, and mold and destroys them at the source. If you're like me, maybe you have a child who suffers from allergies or asthma. It can keep those so-called trigger smells away. No expensive filters to replace. Its compact size allows you to plug it into any room of the house and go. Other purifiers can cost up to $600 for one unit. You can get several thunderstorms for a fraction of that. With the discount code MATT, you'll save an additional 10 bucks. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Enter the discount code MATT to save $10 off their lowest sale price. Again, go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's promo code MATT. You'll get free shipping. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code MATT. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you thinking about purchasing a wood-fired heating or cooking appliance but don't know where to start? The new book, Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking, will guide you through the process and make the decision much easier. Find out about wood stoves, wood-burning fireplace inserts, masonry heaters, cook stoves, brick ovens, and more. Learn about operation and maintenance, buying and storing wood, even how to make your own charcoal. A bonus section includes delicious recipes for cooking in a wood-burning oven, grill, tandoori oven, or smoker. The wise homeowner, prepper, or homesteader will have the ability to heat their home with wood when the power goes out or to save money on increasing gas bills. Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking is available at Amazon. Visit www.woodfiredpub.com for more information. That's woodfiredpub.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks Program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez.
Lou, in 2004, the National Security Agency declassified a document called Communications with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It was written in 1966 and makes mention of the possibility of communications with radio frequencies. Now, the only organization I'm aware of that publicly is doing research into extraterrestrial communication is SETI, which was established as a nonprofit in 1984. So my question is this, in your opinion, could there be an active radio frequency monitoring project going on that would work with NORAD and be out of the public eye? I am really glad you, you asked that question. First of all, I, I mentioned that article. Um, there was an article in a, uh, in, in a periodical about a week ago that I mentioned as an example of how the U S is beginning to loosen some of its restrictions on, on UAP reporting and, and that related to UFOs. And I quoted that article and, um, it was, I think I, I, I probably wasn't clear. Um, I had a couple of people reach out and say, Lou, you probably need to be more clear in the future because you're creating some confusion. So let me apologize. First of all, for saying that second of all, um, that report that came out from 1964, um, absolutely talks about about communicating with potentially some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence um you know my the reason why i i talked about it was simply to emphasize the fact that there does seem to be some sort of loosening of of some of the government restrictions around this topic um i did not mean to imply that it had just come out and was just released by the nsa so let me caveat that but with that said um you know SETI has long been been assigned that responsibility, but there's other organizations. Um, let's let's look at this um, holistically. NASA is spending millions of dollars of our taxpayer money each year looking for microbial life uh, within our solar system. And as you mentioned, SETI is spending a lot of money trying to find techno signatures, radio signatures from some sort of civilized society within our own galaxy maybe even beyond. Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that rely on RF radio frequency to communicate, whether it's telemetry of satellites or aircraft or anything like that. Um, I, I think it's fair to assess that, you know, with those type of capabilities, there's, there's a lot of eyes and ears in the sky right now. Um, and it's, you know, not necessarily just NSA. Um, everybody knows about NSA, National Security Agency, because of their mission, primarily signals, intelligence, and, and some other stuff. Um, but there's other organizations that have a lot of capability as well. Um, and, and some of these are Department of Defense agencies, some of these are intelligence agencies, and some of these are kind of a mishmash of both. Um, you know, let's put this in, yeah, you mentioned NORAD. Well, to track satellites, you know, um, a lot of times NORAD relies on all sorts of things to track satellites. Um, some of it may be radar. Some of it may be through through uh, radio frequency identifiers, right? So there's, again, there's a lot of eyes and ears looking into the sky. Air Force is responsible for monitoring and tracking um, space debris to some degree. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're also looking in, into that, what we call that domain, space domain as well. Um, and, and signals intelligence is certainly a viable way to do it. So I guess a uh, Long story short is there's a lot of organizations that that are, are looking into looking looking in the sky using uh, signals uh, information to to look at things. While on the topic of these agencies, have you been made aware of what part the Space Force, which was created in 2019 and is basically founded upon the Air Force Space Command that was established in 1982, in your best insightful guest or belief, what part will it play in UAP reporting to the new UFO office? I would guess that agency would play a big role in any UAP incursions, right? Well, that decision's not up to me. Um, what I will say is that uh, under the leadership of General Raymond and, and Mr. Cox, uh, the senior civilian, I, I think they're taking this topic seriously. Of course, they have a lot of things to take care of seriously and to consider seriously. Uh, they're a new organization. They've got a lot on their plate, a lot of responsibility, and a lot of um, a lot of demands on them. Um, but I'm, I, I would let them speak for themselves. Uh, you have you have Space Force, and then you have something called Space Command, Spacecom. Um, you know, I think 
Space Force and Spacecom both have uh, an interest in this topic. Um, in fact, not too long ago, I think it was the deputy commander for, for Spacecom came out and said, yeah, we're taking this topic very seriously. And to my understanding, they are indeed taking it seriously. And, and so is Space Force. And so uh, without going into too much detail um, about what Space Force might or might not be doing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic um, in, in, in what they're doing and, and the future that they may play in, in the topic of UAPs. I'm excited to see what will come forth with that. And I often wonder about the authority and influence a handful of aerospace contractors may have had over the research and secrecy in involved with the UAP topic in general. I mean, it would make sense that they're always striving to develop incredible technologies to sell to the military. But I also wonder about your experience trying to get the government to take the topic seriously when you are with a tip and now with Chris Mellon's article on the vacuum of data where the Air Force is concerned. What is your opinion on this? Could it be that basically any and all designated UAP data is just being downstream to contracted private corporations and that the new UAP office will basically suffer the same fate with lack of data? Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> Okay, Christina. Damn, <laughs> I want to know who's, who's who's asking you to ask these questions. Great questions. Um, you know the, the the role U.S. government contractors have played in our national security is is no big secret. They, they you know folks like Lockheed and Boeing and TRW and Grumman and you know all those folks Northrop. Um, you know, they're the reasons why we've had and maintained a competitive edge over our adversaries because they were at the cutting edge of science. And because of that, you had innovations like the U-2 spy airplane. You had the Lockheed YF-12A, uh, SR-7, the Blackbird. Uh, you had all these innovations, right? The, the F-17, forgive me if you hear my dogs barking. I've got four German shepherds here. Um, and sometimes they get a little mouthy. Um, maybe maybe they're telling me I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> but um, the uh, the role of, of our contractors have always been vital to our national security. Um, they tend to bring the the best and the brightest. One can look at uh, just do a, a Google search on the Jasons you know committee, uh, where you bring in the very brightest in our scientific community to help us solve big problems, real problems. Um, and so so we need the work and the help of our contractors um, because they do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. You know, uh, there's an old saying, um, you know, like BASF, right? We don't make a lot of the products you buy. We make a lot of the products you buy better. Well, same thing here. Um, the U.S. contractors um, make a lot of the capabilities that we have better uh, and and um, we need them. Now, what is their involvement in the historical UAP topic? Well, that is something we are still trying to um, figure out completely. Um, it's very likely historically they played a role in this. Um, I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to say what companies and what specific roles they might or might not have played in, but you know, one only has to look at ATIP and we had contractors, you know, um, look at OSAP. We had contractors, um, look at anything that we do sensitive and you'll find contractors are always part of that, that calculus. And there's a reason for it, a valid reason for it. What we don't want to do is put the contractor in a position where now they're making authoritative decisions on behalf of the government, um, because that's neither right nor is it fair. It's not fair to the U.S. government and it's certainly not fair to the contractor. Um, so um, whatever role some of these companies may or may not have played in historically in the topic of UAPs, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to get a better handle on, on that. And what we need to do is create a capability to allow those legacy efforts to uh, help inform um, any new effort that we, we may be engaged in as a country. I warned you before the show, I've been doing my homework with these questions, but I'll tell you what led me to that one. And that is the interview I did with Ross Coltart. And he said there are West Coast contractors that have full access to both monitoring and crash retrievals. So that led me down that rabbit hole with that question. Okay, so moving on. Well, you sure know how to make me squirm. <laughs> 
You have been watching the UAP research movement for quite some time now in a civilian capacity, and you always say that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Given all of the developments over the last 12 months with media reports and the ufology community, are you pleased with the progress made or are you disappointed? And the reason I ask this is because in a recent interview with Jimmy Church, you said you wish you could destroy ufology as it is to stay as it is today and to start it anew yeah well that's that's two different things isn't it um am i happy of the progress we have collectively made all of us together yes absolutely uh i think we've come in just the last four years possibly farther than we have in the last 75. um uh, you know I, a lot of people come out there and say well what have you done you know at this point if i gotta if i gotta write a list for you it's gonna be several pages long and and, and people out there who've been following this topic know damn well what we've been doing so I'm, I'm not going to waste your time, you know, going over that comprehensive list again, uh, but it's exhaustive. Um, you know, as far as ufology, um, look, we're, we're seeing it right now, right? We're seeing a, a handful of, of charlatans trying to, to hijack the narrative once again of this topic um, and put out a bunch of junk and garbage and disinformation and, and you know fortunately i think most people are smart enough but but there's some people who aren't and they get caught up in it um and uh at the end of the day i think you know ufology is its own worst enemy i'm not a ufologist i never have been i never will be i'm, I'm not a ufologist um I'm, I'm just a, an ex-intelligence officer that was given a job the same job as hunting terrorists and spies just to hunt ufos um, and, and we applied the same methodologies to do, to do all three. And so, um, I think, you know, we, we need to get rid of the, the speculation in any windows and everybody trying to put some crazy narrative that is ill-informed. They have no idea about anything and they're just pure speculation and, and they're selling it as absolutes. And, and I cannot believe the amount of people that fall for it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's frankly, not only is it mind boggling, it's, it's really disheartening. I mean, are we really that ignorant as a species, because if we are, then you know what, maybe we're not ready for the truth. You know, maybe I made a mistake coming out four years ago because maybe society just really isn't ready. Um, I hope that's not the case, but the way we treat each other, look at social media on any particular day and it's appalling. And it's, it's all these you supposed experts in UFO in ufology, right? Well, hate to tell you, there are no experts. Otherwise we'd have figured it out by now. We'd all be flying around in UFOs. So please cut the crap. Um, you know, I, I'm tired of people saying, well, you know, we know damn well. Well, you know, we don't know damn well. And stop telling people that because you're wrong. We don't know. You know, I wish we did. I wouldn't have put my career on the line to do this if we we did. If someone had just told me to shut up and color, Lou, and, and we've got all this taken care of, then I would have because I'm a patriot. But that never occurred. And the more I search, the more we real, I realize and my colleagues that there's a lot of information out there. And, and we're not doing the right thing with it. And so, you know, I do want to blow up ufology. I, I, I love the people in it, but I think as a whole, we have, we have corrupted something to the point where nobody in their right mind even wants to look into this topic because it's so fraught with stigma and taboo and people talking about, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's people from Alpha Proxima, Alpha Centauri or the Pleiades. And I know this because I had a download. Well, that's great, but you know, th that doesn't help us much because there's no way to measure that. There's no way to prove that it's, 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 it's fairly subjective, you know? So we have to approach this very scientifically and I'm not saying their opinions aren't valid, but at the end of the day, they're just opinions. Stop stating them as fact. That's why I don't give my opinion. People ask, Lou, what do you think? You know what? It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the facts suggest and what the data suggests because I am not going to make that same mistake as everybody else. It's just, we, we have to have, we have to exercise some sort of self-restraint. We've got to be willing to approach this scientifically, just like Galileo, when he was proposing that the earth was not the center of the galaxy, right? And there are people that even refuse to look through the, through his telescope. Um, and, and they could have seen the truth right there, but they, they didn't. Um, and I think to some degree we're in, we're in the same situation now. You know, I, I know everybody wants answers and, and in the absence, absence of answers, we tend to fill in the blanks with what we think, but, but sometimes what we think isn't necessarily what we know. And, and we have to put, re remember that there's a difference between a personal truth and a universal truth. You know, a personal truth is something like, 
religion or political affiliation or, or you know something like that, where a, a universal truth is like gravity, right? We're, we're all subject to that. Um, and, and we have to be able to, to reconcile the two. And, and we don't because there's a lot of emotion in this topic. And I understand that. I appreciate that. Believe me, I, I gave up my career because of it. So I, I get the emotion. But we have to resist the urge of going down that rabbit hole and saying, yes, this is a way to do it. And this is absolutely the answer because we don't know yet. You know, and, and what happens is that people will seize upon that and they'll take advantage of people and they, you know, charge people an exuberant amount of money to go on a UFO expedition when in reality there's nothing there. You know, I can't tell how many shows that you'll watch and just say, oh, a portal opened up. What the hell does that even mean? What? You, you, what the portal? What? Where are you even getting that? What does that mean? What, what scientific evidence are you suggesting that? Because you see something in the sky and all of a sudden now you're taking a leap that there's some sort of portal to where? Another dimension, another time, another space? What, what, what physics are involved? What are you talking about? What do you even know what a portal looks like? You know, is even there such a thing as a portal? So these are the things that, that you know, I'm just harping on one you know, a little example, but we got to avoid that. We have to avoid that. That's why when we were doing our show with Unidentified, you know, we didn't provide answers deliberately because we made it, we made a decision. We were not going to provide any type of speculative answers. Here's the facts. Here's what the witnesses are saying. You figure it out because we don't know yet, you know, and, and we're, we're trying to, trying to solve this mystery together. So anyway, it's a bit of a long winded. I know I tend to get a bit emotional about it, but you know, I, it, it's very frustrating. Um, it, it's very frustrating to see how people have managed to to try to hijack this narrative and and twist it and contort it. And, you know, they wonder why nobody pays attention. Well, you know, look in the mirror because you guys are acting nutty. Stop, stop doing that. Resist the urge to always have an, you know, have your answer and your narrative be the one. Let let science do its job. Anyways, with that, I'll shut up. That's right. And as you say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Lou, I quote you all the time with that. It's so important for me and my younger audience to keep a grip while learning about all of these aspects of this topic, uh, not falling into the trap of fantastical science fiction that sometimes gets put up as anecdotal evidence. Now, I'm curious It, it might turn about out to be fantastical science fiction. But we got to let the data prove it. We can't just speculate. And that's what I'm saying is, look, you know, I, I don't know where this is going to lead other than we now know it's real. So, so let's have a little patience. Let's continue doing what we're doing. We, we've got come a long way in four years. You know, yeah. let's, I, I, think we're, I think we're on the right track. And the beautiful thing about data and facts and science is that it doesn't have emotion, doesn't have bias or opinion. It just tells you exactly how it is. And that's why the Galileo Project is absolutely fantastic. But to change gears a little bit, I'm curious about how you perceive the changes to the treatment of the UAP topic and to the researchers by the agencies of the U.S. government since the 1980s. Specifically, I'm referring to the section of Chris Mellon's article where he goes into the detail about Air Force interest in the topic, and I quote, the Air Force denied any interest in the UAP topic, yet there are many reasons to doubt these claims. For example, retired USAF Special Agent Richard Doty has repeatedly claimed, consistent with the Robertson panel's recommendations, that the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, the OSI, conducted clandestine surveillance of U.S. citizens and forged documents to manipulate and discredit such groups during the 1980s. At least one UFO researcher, Bill Moore, admitted spying on his civilian colleagues on behalf of OSI. This all seems in direct contrast with the situation today where nobody seems to have any clue of what's going on. And the topic has now been such more mainstream without so much of the ridicule factor. What's your perception on this? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we need to refrain from trying to, to point fingers. Um, you know, 
Look, here, here's the bottom line. I went down to Uruguay to Montevideo to one of the oldest UFO government sponsored UFO organizations in this hemisphere. It turns out it's in Uruguay and it's a military organization that's that's sponsored by by the Uruguayan military to look and track UFOs. Now, um, when I was down there, I asked them, you know, what what predicated this? Why why did you guys get involved in this? And they pull out a memorandum from 1978, it's a memo. And guess what the letterhead on that memo was? It was from the United States Embassy. This is supposedly after Blue Book was shut down, nothing to see here, folks, UFOs aren't real. Turns out there was a direct request by the United States Embassy to the government of Uruguay to establish their own UFO program, which they did, they subsequently did. Um, so that's a fact. You know, we can, we can hide all day long behind, you know, details, but that's real. That's a tangible document that that document exists and it was done by us. So there has to be a reason for it. Right. And there has been a long history of Air Force involvement in this topic. And I, again, I don't want to point fingers because ultimately we need the Air Force's help. Um, you know, I, I don't want now that the, the gopher is finally sticking its head out of the hole. The last thing I want to do is scare it. It goes back under the hole for another 70 years. Right. We, we want to coax it out and we want to let it know. No, we're not going to you know, we're, we're not going to attack you. We're not going to grab you. You know, what we want to do is simply talk to you. You know, we, we want to have a conversation. Um, and that's hard because, as you know, again, a lot of people are emotional. A lot of people want answers. A lot of people want their quote unquote pound of flesh for for apparently injustices that may have been done in the past. But, but we have to avoid that. You know, we have to do somewhat of a, in my opinion, something like a truth and reconciliation uh, like you had in, in, in you know, to, to a much more extreme degree. But like in Rwanda, where you had both sides coming to the table and say, look, you know, a lot of bad stuff was done. But to get the truth out, we're willing to forgive and and kind of, if you will, give everybody a pass on this so we can finally get to the bottom of this and put this behind us. And maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's what we need as a whole of government approach. Maybe we need that with the United States Air Force, some sort of amnesty program and say, look, you know, no one's going to get in trouble here. What was done in the past, what's in the past is in the past. Let's move forward. Let's look forward. Um, let's move forward together. We need your help. And, and here's how we do it. That's, you know, that's one, one way we could do it. We could go about doing it. I sure do hope so. Lou, Final question, hotspots, places where there are UFO flaps going on around in the country or on the coast. So let me ask you this. If you had the tickets, the accommodation, the best equipment to go sky watching, where are some of the places, in your opinion, it would be best to go gazing at the skies? Wow. Um, look, we, we are aware of hotspots. Right um, off the coast of California, off of there by 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 between San Diego and uh, and uh, an island in Mexican waters down there, um, that seems to be a pretty hot spot. There's a lot of local fishermen, military, civilian pilots, Navy that are seeing um, these 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 UAPs quite frequently. There's other areas as well. Uh, we know that there seems to be an interest around our nuclear key nuclear facilities, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, I'd love to have some sort of static surveillance looking at that all the time. Um, you know, I'd love to have some some capabilities out in the middle of nowhere. Think of a, a, a an offshore derelict oil rig that's not being used anymore, right? Let's put some cameras up there. Let's get Avi Loeb to put some of those Galileo capabilities out there in the middle of nowhere where you don't have any light pollution and completely occluded, unoccluded skies in the middle of the ocean. And, and, and let's just sit there for a month and see what we see. Right. There's all there. I think there's, there's, you know, tell me right now, if I had uh, unlimited resources, where would I go? Well, I'd go to a lot of places and um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bottomless pit of money we need. I think there's probably seven or eight key areas that we could, we could, set up some sort of capabilities and i think we'll probably find some answers you know in, in the near term lou thanks so much for your time today and joining me here on shifting the paradigm where can people find you online to keep up to date with your efforts and research oh my gosh well i think you keep a better track of of it than i do <laughs> of where i am um by the way for the record that that island i was referring to is called Juan de Lupe island 
um, but civilians are not allowed on it. Um, but uh, interesting place. I forgot to clarify. I meant to say that, and I, I got you know I got uh, sidetracked. Um, where can they go? Um, you know, I I don't have a big social media presence. I am on Twitter. Um, I, I I do that so so people can stay informed. Um, I wish I could I could be on it more than I than I am. I do look at it. And, and I do look at every tweet, believe it or not, uh, which is a lot of work. Um, I don't have time to respond to everything. Um, you know, what I what I do try to do is get as much as I can on these podcasts. I mean, a lot of people will say, well, Lou, why, you know, you do, you do all these major mainstream outlets, you know, all over, whether it's CNN or Fox News or ABC and NBC. Why do you do these small podcasts? Because those big media outlets are just five minute sound bites. This, this is intimacy. This is an ability to really get into the meat of, of the topic and have a conversation with people who are very interested. You know, when people watch mainstream media, not everybody's necessarily interested in that topic. But when you go to these more boutique style uh, productions, you know, your, your, your crowd tends to be people who, who are interested and want answers. And so that's why I do a lot of these. As you know, I don't get paid. I don't make a penny off this. Uh, despite what some of these these people like to think, you know, oh, who's making all this money? I actually, haven't made a penny. So nice try, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, it's uh, it's something I do because I, I believe in it. I believe part of the the public engagement, our fifth pillar of engagement, is public engagement, and this is part of it. And and there's only one way to do it, and that's to you know to put yourself out there, as uncomfortable as it may be for me as a former intel officer. I, I've spent my life and my career in the shadows. I don't particularly enjoy being a, a out in the public like this but in order to have the conversation you, you got to put yourself out there uh, unless somebody can think of another way to do it which I, I'd, I'd be happy to oblige um, but so far no one's been able to propose to me an alternative so so I do this and I do this because I, I, I believe in what we're doing and I believe in you and I believe in your audience and and you know I think together we've, we've come really really far and I think together we're going to go a hell of a lot further we definitely are Lou thank you again Always my pleasure, Christina. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, and thank you on behalf of, of all my, my, my friends and colleagues. Thank you to your wonderful, wonderful audience for, for taking the time to be with us today, uh, because this is only happening because of, of your involvement and the involvement of your audience. I'm just one guy, you know, it's, I can't, I can't take the hill by myself. And so we're, we're, we're taking the hill, all of us together and, and, and we're winning the battle. You're listening to the UnX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. I hope you enjoyed today's show. It's always a pleasure to speak to Mr. Elizondo and hear his insights on questions that we all have. I want to wish you a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.